some new developments in this field. I'll look in detail at one of the enhancements that has been implemented there and talk about some challenges that they are facing. Here's an architectural overview of the Vertio framework. We have a guest running on top of KVM and uh, this guest has Vertio drivers which communicate to the vhost module and host kernel. Then the setup is done by user space uh, QMU process which binds KVM and the host and also creates event of the objects which serve for communication between the host and the guest. They forward interrupts from host to guest and they forward the IO notifications from guest to host. Let's skip all that. Right. So one of the interesting things that we can do is use the vhost and the event of the modules from user space instead of using them from a kernel. So that's what we did. We replaced the guest with a, a testing framework which runs in the user space and links with guest virtio code. And it performs all of the setup that KMU normally performs so that to get notifications from host to guest, we use a, a regular poll system call. And uh, to notify the host about guest events, we use a write system call. So what we get is a small uh, standalone utility that you can run in a very simple way. So let's assume that we want to do some kind of change in Virtio. We edit the file, right? We build it. We can actually, because all of the code is part of the Linux kernel tree, we can use a single commit to modify both the test and the guest drivers. And then uh, we load the module in host kernel and you run it uh, as uh, any user space utility. So you can, for example, use that as a simple micro benchmark to see what kind of effect your change has on virtual performance. So I'm going to describe one of such changes uh, and we use the, this utility to, to, to verify the effect of that. But first, a very short overview of the virtual ring design. So virtual ring is a shared memory design. It is uh, it actually uh, uses shared memory to pass requests from guest to host. Virtio itself doesn't care what the requests are. So what we do, we store a request descriptor in shared memory accessible to host and we notify the host that there is a new request by storing a pointer to that descriptor in an available ring. Now the host notices that there is a new request available and it will go ahead and process that in a device specific way. For example, for a network, it would take the packet and it would send it out to the network as appropriate. And once processing has been done, it will notify the guest by storing a pointer to the descriptor in the use ring. Optionally, the host can also notify the guest uh, about this update by sending an interrupt from host to the guest. So one thing that we noticed is an interesting race window. What happens if uh, the host stores a use ring entry and uh, hey. So we store a use ring entry and uh, uh, we notify the guest about that by sending an interrupt from host to the guest. So here we have the host notifying the guest about uh, uh, completion of some request and then we send an interrupt from a host to the guest. Now before the guest has time to process that entry, we add another entry in the use ring. What happens now is that uh, the guest might start handling the interrupt that the host sent it and it might process both of the entries. Yes, at this point it might get the interrupt and it will see that there's nothing in the ring. So there's some waste going on here. We have wasted the interrupt. So one of the solutions is that the guest is going to publish a, an additional piece of information to the host, which we call the event index. And it means that the guest says, I only want an interrupt when you write that, that entry in the use ring. Now, 
What happens is when the host writes an, uh, an entry in the use ring, it's going to send an interrupt for the first entry. But when it writes the next entry, it's going to see that the guest didn't want an interrupt for that one. So we are not sending an interrupt, and there's no wastage now. Yeah, we are happy. Uh, at some point in the future, the guest is going to process the existing entries in the ring. And then it's going to see that the ring is empty and update the event index. Afterwards, the host adds a new entry in the ring, and it's going to send an interrupt again. Right. So that's what we call the event index feature. How are we going to implement it without breaking existing guests which don't support the feature? Or uh, how are we going to uh, enhance the drivers in such a way that they work on existing hosts which don't support the feature? So Virtio has a special uh, capability for that, which is called the feature bits. And what we do is we need to declare support for this feature in the feature bit mask. And it needs to be supported in all of the units in vhost and QMU and virtio. Only if supported at all of the levels, then the feature is enabled. If not, we fall back to a backward compatible mode. So we start with 32 feature bits, but it turns out that 28 of these are uh, already dedicated to specific devices. We are left with four, but it turns out that two of them were used in the past. But for some legacy features, we are not using at the moment. So we select one of the two feature bits that are left, and the, the last one will be used to extend the feature bit mask to 64 bits, probably. We add support to vhost, and QMU will check the vhost module in host kernel and detect that there is a new feature available. It will now expose this feature to the guest. And finally, Virtio needs to check this feature bit that it got from QMU. And need to acknowledge that. Last but not least, we want to extend the test so that we can compare the performance with and without this feature available. So lots of work, but it seems that there are some benefits. So when run without event of the index, we can check the, comp the backward compatibility mode. And we get some results. And uh, now we enable the feature. And we see that there is a very nice speed up. One interesting thing to note here is that it turns out that the system, uh, the, the time CS spent in system mode is now much lower than the user mode. So that's something to explore. That's it mostly for Vietio. I'm going to talk about networking now. I think. One of the most exciting features in networking uh, was the recently introduced uh, copy avoidance patches uh, by Shirley Ma from IBM. They got merged. Uh, and um, before I describe them, I'd like to talk a bit about uh, what exactly is the copy that we are trying to avoid here. right? So see, here's how we are going to send data. We start with the packet in guest kernel memory. And we pass a pointer to it to vhost, which is translating this pointer from guest physical to host virtual memory. And then it passes the pointer onto a tab device associated with the host. Now, this tab device, what it does is it takes a pointer and copies the data into host kernel memory. And this copy is then forwarded on to the specific NIC device which can actually send it out on the wire. So there is uh, an obvious waste here. We are doing this copy. It would be much nicer if the NIC could get data directly from the guest memory. And that's conceptually what the patches do. So that's the C copy thing. We start with the packet again. We send it out to uh, the host, as usual, and then once it gets to the tab device, the tab device, instead of copying the packet, is going to lock it into host memory and make it available to the network device. Now, at some point, and possible, it's going to pass the pointer 
to this packet to the Nick device, and Nick is going to read it directly from guest memory. That's great. Once that is done, we can uh, notify the vhost module, and that is going to tell the guest that, uh, oh, I'm sorry, first we unlock uh, the packet in host memory, and now we can notify uh, the guest that it can reuse this, the memory associated with this packet for something else, right? The resources associated with it. So here are some numbers for sufficiently large message sizes. This is a network run. We get very nice speed up. Naturally, this is a guest to external, so we are limited by the speed of the uh, bare metal. But it does seem to help. However, there are several challenges that need to be overcome. So it's not all that simple. One of these has to do with setups that want to apply some kind of filtering or modification to the packet sent by the guest and the host. Now what happens is we take the packet, lock it in memory, and forward the, the pointer to the bridge. And now what if we wanted to limit the guest to sending out packets to port 80? Because we know that's safe, right? OK, so we go and check and see, haha, OK, there is a match. Destination port 80, we are going to forward this packet on to the NIC. But what happens is that the gate might be, guest might be malicious, all right? And the packet is in the guest memory, so it can go ahead and modify that packet. It modifies the port number to something much more scary. And at this point, the NIC is going to access that packet and send it out. We have uh, bypassed our filter. I'm not sure what exactly is the port number for ping of death, but maybe that's the thing that is trying to achieve uh, the guest. Anyway, we are not happy with that design. So here was, here's one way to solve that. We are going to copy any kind of data before we look at that. So again, we are going to look at the port number. So we will copy the packet header, which includes the port number into the SKBuff structure in host kernel. And afterwards, we are going to look at the copied data and see, aha, uh -huh, OK, there's a match. We are going to allow that packet to go out. And the NIC will look at the copied data to transmit the packet. Now, here's a malicious guest trying to modify the packet to bypass the filter in some way. Yes, it has no problem modifying the, the packet in its memory, but it's not going to affect the packet going out uh, because the NIC is going to access the copied SK buff, which is, has port number 80. Yeah, we are happy. Good. OK, here is another challenge. How about zero copy receive? Why only transmit? Right, conceptually, it's very simple. Let's uh, get a buffer in guest memory. We have want to store the packet there. Lock it up. Now we get a packet, and the NIC will just go ahead and store that in the appropriate location in guest memory. So one of the problems is what happens if we have multiple guests using the NIC. Now, we don't really know. Maybe the packet should have gone to the second NIC to the second guest. So that's uh, another challenge which we need to overcome. It's common with bridge setup. What if the destination of the packet is not outside the, uh, outside the host? It might be within the host. So here's how guest-to-guest -guest communication might work. We start with the packet and guest memory, we don't really know whether the destination is within or outside the host, so we lock it just in case. And now it gets queued at the top device associated with another guest. At some point, the guest gives us a buffer, and we go ahead and copy the data from the original packet to this buffer. So actually, there is a single copy here, but that's all right. Yes, so now that the copy is done, the, the first guest 
can re release the resources associated with the original packet. But what happens if the second guest is malicious or just broken and slow, right? We have a packet in guest uh, A that we want to send. We send it out, locked, and it gets queued on the top device. But guest B doesn't consume it. Now we get another packet, and it gets queued in the same way, and so on. Until finally, the first guest is going to run out of resources. So at that point, it might be unable to communicate to guest B, which might be all right, but it's probably also unable to communicate to outside world and, and, and the external interface, which not, might not be all right because it's not doing anything wrong. It's a guest B that is malicious. That's uh, something bit, some challenge that we need to over, uh, overcome here. Let's look at another new feature that is currently being developed. Multi-queue actually helps setups which uh, use SMP and go guest on the host. At the moment, we have a single queue used on the guest, and this means that a sufficiently modern NIC, which is able to process incoming packets in parallel on two host CPUs, guest contention when two uh, receive side queues and the NIC feed into a single uh, queue on the top device and onto the guest. And we also underutilize multiple queues that the NIC might expose to the host on the transmit side. And the solution is conceptually pretty simple. We will use multiple tap backends. I will connect them to multiple queues in the guest within a single device. And now we will get no contention. So here are some numbers. Uh, when using multiple sockets, with a single queue, we actually see some performance degradations when the number of socket grows. But with multiple queues, we can get much closer to wire speed. So here is a quick summary. There are some new enhancements that has been implemented in Virt.io. Zero copy transmit currently works with Macvita backends and multi-queue is being worked on. We still need to work on zero copy receive to support zero copy with bridge setups which enable filtering and guest-to-guest -guest communication and the level interrupts are not currently supported with EventFD. Any questions? <coughs> 